This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com. And on the other end, in New York right now, we have wrestling legend, the grappler, Len Denton. How are you doing tonight, sir? Good, sir. How are you doing, buddy? And thank you for that great introduction. That makes me feel good. I don't know what kind of a legend I was, but I, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we actually had Demolition Axe on not too long ago, and he wanted me to ask you a story about the time that he took off your boot. And your <laughs> How is that possible? I said, no, this was insane. I swear. I mean, um, okay, so I don't know. I'd been working about, hell, it's had to be 20 years and or 15 years. And me, I don't know if you're familiar, but me and Roddy Piper were business partners. We owned a an automotive shop, a transmission shop. And so I was just wrestling part-time through that that era, that that part of my life. And so I didn't use my loaded boots, you know, my wrestling boots and my gear that much. And matter of fact, so then I got booked in a show in Florida, a big wrestling reunion show. And so I got them out of the uh, garage and got the cobwebs off the boots and all the stuff and got my tights and went to Florida having a good time. And I'm working with Bill Eady of all people and so i didn't realize these things that got dry rotted okay and so i remember they were really stiff trying to get them on and all this stuff and um i went out there and we're doing a um we're doing a finish where you know like i set up the thing where i said okay i'll load the boot i'll shoot you i start, you, you know you nail me i'll cut you i'll shoot you and you catch the boot spin me around clothesline me start untying the boot and then pull the boot off you know and then um, once you get it off, I said, it's hard to get off, Bill, because, you know, it's, it's a lot of strength. No, it's, uh, it's a different type of boot. You got to get them strings really undone. I'll be pushing with my foot at the same time. When it pops off, I'll get up in the rest of the finish and all that. So we went into the thing, boss. <laughs> and so he starts some time of pulling like hell, and he's yanking. He thinks, well, I really, this thing really won't come off. And I'm pushing my other foot, and, and the, the boot just actually – Right around the ankle, just ripped off, and he come right off my foot. He thought he tore my foot off. <laughs> and he, got, he stopped me, just stared at me. I went, "Hit me with a son of a bitch! Don't you stare at me, Bill!" And so, anyway, that's it was, if you'd have seen it, you'd have laughed your ass off. I mean, it shocked both of us. I went, "What the hell?" And so he goes, "He took my loaded boot off, all right. He thought my foot was still in it." <laughs> but it was a classic. I've never seen that ever before. <laughs> How did you get involved in wrestling? Oh, brother, I, um, I was uh, well. I was born and raised in uh, Humble, which is outside of Houston, Texas. And um, my uh, friend of my dad's was kind of interested in it. They used to go watch the rep. Paul Bosch was a famous promoter, you know, down at the Coliseum in, in, in Houston every Saturday night. And everybody at that time knew him, who that was. And, and so uh, – he was interested in trying to get into it, and I kind of went with them to watch the matches. And then he ended up doing some construction work for Tiger Conway Sr., the Tiger Conway Jr.'s dad. And so one thing led to the other, and then um, my dad's friend, he didn't he didn't hack it, but I ended up getting into it. They didn't get me into it. They actually – that's how it started. And then I went I went even tried Lucha, which they had Lucha down south there. And a little bit, and then I left there and went to another guy, and it left from one trainer to the next. And finally, I got trained in uh, a guy named Nick Kozak, who was a referee for Paul Bosch. His brother, Jerry Kozak, was uh, running spot shows and stuff for the Funks in Amarillo. That's when D Dory was the world champion, and Terry, you know, they were all, they were big deal. They had they owned their own territory, you know, Amarillo, and so. That was the first place uh, he got me, Nick got me booked there. And then I got there and uh, that's how it got started. That's the first place it started for the farms. What was the training like in Amarillo? They were known for being uh, pretty hardcore with their training. Yeah, I lasted two weeks and they fired me. So I was too small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. So they wouldn't use me on TV. Uh, I just, you know, well, it's a, it was a big man sport at the time. Uh, I'm sitting in the dressing room with uh, Cyclone Negro, Abdul the Butcher, Sweet Hanson. All these guys are 360, 350, and I'm 17, and I weighed 189 pounds. 
And so they, they wouldn't even put me on TV, you know, but they'd use me for a few shows, but it went from there. But luckily, um, um, I believe it or not, Abdul the Butcher uh, told me, I told, I was telling him, you know, I was leaving once I got uh, fired. And he said, you know, kid, if you, if you really want to try it, he said, won't you write a letter to Dory Funk Jr.? And, and, you know, and ask him, he said, he knows everybody. He's the world champion. He might can get you somewhere. And so I did. And, think, and if it wasn't for that, I guess Dory felt sorry for me. And at that time, Bill Watts was taking over Leroy McGurk's territory. Okay. And, what he had. and so I ended up going there because he was hiring any guy that, anybody that could wear tights at the time. And I ended up going there and then getting on the sauce and getting bigger. And the story goes on and on, you know, different territories. But that's how that's how it all gets started, you know. Any memories of Terry Funk from those days, those early days? Uh, I was, you know, they were in and out all the time. And I was only there two weeks. I do oh. remember, <laughs> you know, I've seen him in other territories because I kept working from there. Like I said, luckily I got booked. But uh, Terry was just... Uh, Oh, he was going 100 miles an hour, and that, and that was one of the days when he was really having some great matches, and, and his brother was the world champion. So where I was sitting at, boss, was I was like a job boy at the time, so I didn't get to associate too much with those guys unless I was just doing a job for them. So, but uh, I've known Terry for, I mean, I don't know how many years now, you know, and I always liked Terry, but uh, he was, uh, I don't have any stories from those days back then exactly. With Terry, because I was I was running with the the younger guys and guys just trying to make it, you know what I mean? Guy and Terry was on top all over the country, so I didn't really run with or you know travel with him or do anything with Terry. I mean, Terry was, you know, as far as I knew, was one of the best workers in the business at the time. But I I, I don't have any stories from that time. Or I was just traveling, trying to make it, and I was with the underneath guys and trying to survive and. Um, and Terry was on top everywhere, so he flew everywhere. So, so I didn't know. I, mean, I, I just like any any fan, I would see his matches and stuff. But, uh, but I mean, I know I've known him all these years now, and you know, and Terry, and we're we're friends. And and uh, he see every time he sees me, he'll come in and go like this. He'll look at me, and I could Terry cut that shit. He goes, Landon, damn, where'd I know him from? Lynn, that's right, in the real I go, you suck. He laughs and walks off, right? <laughs> he still remembers me being there when I was 180 pounds, you know, little kid. <laughs> James Beard uh, has a comment here. He says he loves you. Any memories of James yeah. Beard? James Beard is a good fella, man. You know, he's a really good guy. I don't think I, I don't know many people that don't like James Beard. <laughs> he's always treating me right, man. He's one hell of a referee, too, man. You know. Definitely, and he's yeah. one of the matchmakers for for SWE Fury yeah. now. You you were yeah. there during their early days. Yeah. Did you have it? Did you have many interactions with the spoiler over the years? Well, I tell you, I was with um, uh, when I when I was re wrestling. Um, I went from um, let's see, I went from uh, to Bill Watts. I said Mid South when he was in the early days. When I was young, and then from there, I went to Florida. And when I went to Florida, there was a guy, uh, Killer Carl Cox and, and uh, Don Jardine, the spoiler. They were riding together overnight. And so I got with those guys, and because Don was a mad, you know, mask guy, right? So uh, he he was kind of a quiet fellow, but he'd give you some advice. And and Cox was, uh, everybody thought was insane, crazy. But he I know, maybe he was, but he had some good advice, too, about working – but as far as it goes to Jardine, we we didn't we worked together like I was an underneath guy and he was on top guy. But I do remember one thing I'll tell you about. They taught me I was wrestling in uh, there. We were in uh, I believe it was Fort, we got was Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I'd been in these spot in these shows and they had me working with this guy. Now in my mind, I was only eighteen years old, right? The guy I'm working with, he's about forty, you know. So I was scared of him anyway on the shoot for real. He didn't speak any English. He was good friends with Louis Tillette, which was the booker at the time. And I'm just trying to keep a job, man, you know. And so so he had me putting this guy over, which is his friend, every night, which I don't mind putting a guy over. But I'm not kidding you. Every night I would get a busted nose or I'd come back with my mouth bleeding, you know. And so one time 
this is in that show I, wrote, I happened to ride with Cox and um, and Don to the town. And so uh, I worked with this guy, and he did it. And I just had it. I had enough, you know. I just pot a crack. So I got up and uh, locked up when he when he when he put his hands down. I just <laughs> I didn't know if it was gonna work because I was just a kid. But luckily, I nailed him right on the button and knocked his ass right out. Okay, he goes down, which was no big feat because he wasn't no giant or nothing. Right? But I mean, he goes down, and now it was funny about it. Sonny Myers was a referee. I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy, but Sonny yeah. goes, Sonny all of a sudden starts going. Harder kid kicked the shit out of him because <laughs> he had been watching these matches, okay, but not saying a word. And so I was so scared. Look, I got an arm bar. He goes, "What are you doing?" I go, "Shit!" The guy comes to. I end up working, finish, and put the guy over. I guess I'm, I'm so scared I'm gonna get fired. When I got back, when I walked through the dressing room door, Cox grabbed me by the throat and slammed me against the lockers in his high school. He said, "You little chicken shit." He said, "Thank God you finally found some balls." Don't ever let nobody abuse you like that, you know? And he said, you don't belong in our business if you do it. But Jardine was right there with him. And on the way to the home, on the way home with those guys, they really, you know, read me the right act and gave me a hell of an education. If you can't, you know, you can't take that and try to survive and be somebody in this business and take that from people. And so I learned a big lesson from Don and Carl and stuff like that. And, you know, st so they helped me out. So he was a good guy, you know, but, you know, that's the way the business is. You Either you're made for it or you're not. You know what I mean? You got a comment here from Dan Masters, the ring announcer at PCW Ultra. He says that he loved being produced by you in Portland and Vegas for TV. He appreciates your advice, and he hopes to catch up with you again soon. Maybe you can party, and he won't get fired, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember him. Yeah. How you doing, buddy? Good to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, um, <laughs> you don't want to party and just get caught and get fired. Sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, that happens, brother. Believe me. But uh, you, you'll get another job. Don't worry about it. <laughs> there, there's a fan on here that would like to know if you have any crazy Iron Sheik or Andre the Giant stories. The Sheik, I don't have much on, you know. I mean, I know how he was like everyone else, and I try to stay away from him. <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but Andre, I do. And uh, this is one that when I tell people – I actually was just telling someone this the other day. It's To me, it, 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 I couldn't believe it. And, uh, and I love both these guys, but I couldn't believe how ego would get in people's way so bad. We're, we're in a spot, you know, Andre would come in, you know, he's a novelty. And so, especially over there in Louisiana, they put him in these spot shows because these people, I mean, unless they get a ticket to go see him, they're never going to see him the rest of their life. And so it, it sells out. It packs the place, you know. The Giants going to be there. So we go and uh, it, it, we're in a six-man tag. It was me, uh, Dick Murdoch, and, and Orton Jr. against Junkyard Dog, Paul Orndorff, and, and Andre in a six-man. In a spot show, it should be like a cakewalk. We got a night off. <laughs> You know, but no, no, we go. And so we go out there and we, we, we you know, we do the spots. We get the bay faces over. And then, okay, it's time to get heat on someone. Now, think about this. Who would you pick? You pick, are you going to be Orndorff or Junkyard Dog or Andre? And so, well, I figure Paul because, you know, they're really pushing the shit out of Junkyard Dog. He's a, he's a key player here in the territory, right? He's a franchise guy. And so I said, well, well, I try to stop Paul. I nail Paul, he nails me back. I said, sell him. Over. I hit him, he, nailed, I suplex, he jumps up, suplex me. I shoot him over the top, go throw him in the post. He picks me up, throws me. I go, fuck. I go, tag dog. So I try dog, right? Can't get dog to sell. Finally, this is no kidding. Andre got so pissed because he, you know, he was a good worker. I mean, psychology was. He goes, tag me in. Just like you hear in Scream Corner. They tagged him in, and I'm in the ring. He goes, he grabs me, he goes, he, and he says, boss, back me in corner, load the boot, and let me sell. I went, what the fuck? <laughs> so, so, so I did, I kicked him, and he staggered out about two or three steps. And like that big old giant was, he goes, oh, he dropped to his knees, and he fell forward all the way down on his face. And start, can you believe that we got heat on the giant and gave them a hot time? <laughs> wow. This is totally, totally ass backwards. Okay, but when Andre came back, 
I could hear him chewing their ass out in the dressing room. He was cut all over them, which was bullshit. Ego got to him, you know. But I mean, yeah, at least psychology wise, brother, I could not believe it, you know. Did so, you ever get the chance to drink with Andre? Oh my God, brother! Yes, yes, I did. I um, a lot of times it was one particular time. You know, when he would fly into a place, if he liked you, you know, like like he knew me and Murdoch, and he'd go, "I want Lenny to drive me." You know, because he knew I had a Lincoln or whatever. He, but not only that, he wanted he wanted you to. If he had to, he rent the car. He wanted you to drive him. You drinking partners. So Andre, I, me and Murdoch had been out drinking for the last two nights, and I was just hung over when Jackson, Mississippi, and that's where Andre flies in to start his two weeks, and I'm hung over as hell. And so I come out, and Andre's on the face side, and, and there's like a big uh, open uh, roll-up door between us where you the fans are. So, he, you know, back then it's kayfabe, and he looks at me he, like this. He steps back. He goes, boss, tonight, me, you, and he goes like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm waiting. I'm stretching out and fixing to ring the bell because I'm in the semi. I get dog, and I'm like, oh, my God, he's stupid shit. I got a hangover, and he wants to go drinking again tonight. And I go, oh, I said, okay, boss, no problem. I came back. I, I got I took my shower and hauled ass back to Baton Rouge. And I went over to uh, to um, Black Bart's. He had a trailer rented on the, across the, the thing here in Baton Rouge. And I didn't even go to my own apartment. Andre found me. Brother, <laughs> he found me. I wish I never would have done that. He he made me drink. He took me, went to After Hours Club, and that last time, last thing I remember, he was holding a mug, and he's like, yeah, I don't even remember drinking it. I was about to fall out of the chair. He said, never run from me, boss man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, brother, he could drink, believe me. Oh, I kill you. Now, speaking of Black Bar, how credible do you think he is, in your opinion? You know him better than I do. Uh, I did an interview with him, and a lot of people yeah. were questioning some of the statements he made. If, What's your opinion on Black Bar? You mean as far as the storylines and stuff, the stories? Yeah. Stuff? Yeah. I tell you, I tell you this, boss. Bart was with all the guys you're talking about. He worked with all of them. Now, I don't know. I mean, I heard all his stories. I don't know how far out he goes with them, but um, but I know that he, as far as the as far as the talent, the Road Warriors, this that he was in, he wrestled, he made trips with all of them, and he's been all those places he's talking about. No, no crap there, but I mean. But, uh, you know, you, <laughs> Black Bart is like, uh, that's Black Bart, brother. What a character. Yeah, I love him to death. Don't get me wrong. But um, he's, I, I don't know, for an example of what, what you think, say, but, but I know what you, you're asking me. And uh, all I know is he was with all the talent he's talking about. I don't know if he exaggerates how bad things were or how small things were. Sometimes I don't know, you know. There's a fan on here, Jack Jerry, wants to know why you never wrestled for WWE. Oh uh, well, what happened was um, I was I'd been wrestling whenever whenever Vince Jr. took it over, and he started shutting everybody down, and he and he started the WWF right. Um, I'd already been working about sixteen or seventeen years, okay, and so uh, whenever he shut Don Owens down which who I was booking for, I said, you know, it's, we're going to close to 18 years. And, and I had two little girls that were smaller, you know, and, and, and I'd been gone. I'd made trips all over the world already. And, uh, and I told, uh, I said, you know what, whenever this is done, I'm going back to Texas, take my family. And cause I want to see these girls grow up. And I know if I go to WWE, I'm going to lose this wife and my family too. It's like the first one like I did on the road for 18 years. And I go, I ain't doing that bullshit again. So I go, and so then I went, and so then I got, was going to come home and then Piper called me and says, Hey, you know what? And he says, I always want to open a small business and you're the only guy I trust my money with. He said, I trust my family with you. And he said, you, you name the business. I'll put the money up. We'll open it up. Stay here in Oregon. And that's, I did because they, they didn't want to move really. They'd been there. So long, and so I go well. So I stayed. I got three, uh, two calls from from Michael Hayes, offering a contract and all that later down the road, and I turned them down because I gave Roddy my word that I would pay the place off and I wouldn't take off. But 
but that's why I never made it. That's why I never went. What was the business that you and Piper were involved with? A transmission automotive shop. We had an automotive shop, yeah. I was trying to, you know, I see so many guys like me that would, that's all they did. I went right out of high school, never had a real job. I was a pro wrestler and got lucky enough to, to have enough talent to make it and made a living doing it. And they, at the end, they had two cents to rub together. You know what I mean? Because So I said, you know what, I'm gonna, while I can, I'm going to get out and try to at least pay this place off. Maybe we can start a franchise. Maybe we can do what so, You know, the big plan was. And then um, and have something besides just nothing. You know what I mean? And so that's yeah. that's why that's why I did that. I know I could I could have went to Vince and maybe you know I could have broke my leg the first day I was there. Who knows? And I've been put on the shelf. But I might have went there and made some good money. But then I'm never going to be home. And here I'm looking at my wife. I go, here we go again. You know, like <laughs> I said, no, nah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a different direction. So that's why I never went. You know? How did you uh, How did you click so well with Roddy Piper that he would be close enough with you to trust you being business partners? He, uh, um, me and Roddy was, um, you know, I met him when I was, uh, well, I was 18, first time I met Roddy, you know, and um, we just were in the same territories together. And I, I don't know, you know, how do you, we just got to be friends and he trusted me and we went through a lot of things together. And uh, he seen I was, uh, I would stand up to my word. If I gave him my word, I'd be there. And so that's, I don't know. We just, you know, I know Roddy, like, uh, whenever I was working for Roddy after we sold the shop and all that, got a wooden shop, and I was just going around with him, and he was making appearances. We went to England, and we went all over the place, and uh, when I quit him, is when my first daughter had my first grandbaby, and he, he says, and he, <laughs> I packed my bags, and we were, we were in L.A., we just got through doing one of those sci-fi conventions, right, and so... The next day, I was sitting in my room with my bags packed because the next morning, we're headed to England, out of L.A. So I, she called and says, Daddy, I, I want water. You know, she's having a kid. So I go, you know what, honey? I'm on the way. And I rolled my bag down, knocked on Roddy's door. <laughs> he, he went ballistic. You're quitting. You you know, we almost got into it. But then by, by the time it was over, he, he stops and looks at me. And this kind of guy Roddy was, he goes like this. Lenny, come here. Gives me a big hug. says, Brother, you're right. Family comes first. Get your ass home and see that grandbaby. <laughs> I said, love you, man. I'll see you. Grab my bag and all that. But that's kind of the way our, our shit went all the time. You know what I mean? Like that. <laughs> what, what was Roddy like to go out with when you would party with him? Was he as wild? <laughs> he was. I, well, when, well he, whenever it was younger, in the younger days, <clears throat> it was crazier than hell. You know what I mean? Toward when, whenever he was working for Vince, like when I was in Portland, he was always flying and he's back out, so he wouldn't have much time. Every once in a while, he'd go out, but yeah, he'd get pretty damn wild, boy. I remember being in Canada with him, working for the Tonys, and oh my God, Roddy doing crazy shit. He's constantly have you laughing though, you know, but always doing something crazy, you know. Do you know his daughter Teal well? She's making her yeah. uh, Texas yeah. debut next Saturday in uh, in Carthage. Yeah, you know, really. Well, see, yeah, I'm, here, I'm here here in New York right now. They say she's in town down the road. I'd like to see her because I was going to ask her. I mean, I never dreamed she would get into it, you know. But uh, I'd, I'd like to see her. Yeah, I knew her. Or she's yeah. a little kid. Yeah. She's, she's starting for SWE, and I'm. I think it's going to be for more than just one shot starting next weekend. So. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. You James live in. Now. Yeah, I, I live in um, a town called Montgomery, Texas. It's about yeah. 50 miles north of Houston. Okay. Yeah. Who was Who was your favorite opponent over the years to be in the ring with? Oh, boss, I had a bunch, but I'll tell you. Uh, I would say uh, Rick Martell was such a good and brother. What a night off! Unreal. Uh, 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 what's it? Uh, Rick Morton. Ricky Morton was good. Uh, you know. Um, um, let's see. Uh, Ted DiBiase. We had great matches. Uh, also, um, trying to think. Uh, Tommy Rich. We had great matches. Guys like that. There's a lot of them. I had good matches with Harley too. Harley Race. 
Holiday was like a really serious. I mean, you got to get down and dig, but he, he, he was he was really easy to work with, you know. Easy. Why did everyone say Harley was so tough? Well, because some of the things he done, you know, like he knocked a guy, the biker out. He wrestled uh, in Portland, and there's some two or three bikers knocking him and sitting at ringside. And this is a shoot. Dynamite Tommy Billington, Tom, Dynamite Kid, told me. He said he was there. I wasn't there on this. But he goes, he says, Harley goes, he wrestled. Uh, he told him he kept giving him shit during the match. He tells the guys, hey, if you guys are, if you're so tough, wait till this is over. And when the people leave, just stay here. I'll make sure they don't throw you out. And let's see what you got. And I said, Harley wrestled about 45 minutes. And then he did the finish and went back. Got his towel wiped off. This guy, this guy still is he ready? He said, okay, tell him to get in the ring. Harley got in the ring. The guy come in. He dropped him, knocked him out, right? One punch. Boom, got on. And, you know, so he would would do, you know, he he had he had some uh he had some balls. He wouldn't uh he's a pretty tough fella, you know what I mean? But uh that's why the, you know he was a man and he stood up for what he said, you know. I never seen him get beat, but I'm sure you know someone would beat him. But I'm just saying I never seen him get beat, you know. John Falsetta says he remembers you well from world class. What are your yeah. favorite memories of world class? <laughs> world class. I, I like I like the world class. Uh, uh, I like the territory. Of course, it's Texas, of course, you know, but we used to have some fun. There's a lot of good guys working there, you know, and it was uh, uh, the Von Hertz sometimes it was, drove us crazy because they're always pulling shit and causing problems, but but the territory was great, man, you know, and all the guys working there, uh, you know, it was, it was easy. It paid cash every night. You had to wait on a check. It was like, it was one of the boys. If you want to go to a party, it's one of the boys' territories, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was made for the boys, you know? Yeah, it seems like the Von Erich boys did their fair share of partying. Oh, my God, brother. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. But – um thing is they were so well known and they were so well over even though they couldn't work with the shit they were so well over that they had a microscope on them you know and so they they didn't know how to handle that they get caught doing everything there was a fan on here that said they saw you wrestle goldberg is he is he ribbing me or did you actually have a have a match with goldberg at one no i worked with goldberg yeah yeah i did how did that come about well I well I was okay. I was talking about the shot, right, with me and Roddy. So yeah. so I, we were about um eight or nine years in and I already had the place down to where I knew I was gonna pay it off. And so uh everybody that's when they started doing the switch over to WCW and everybody right. was getting these big contracts. Of course, I'm still in the business, I know everybody, and they're calling me Lenny, you need to come get some of this gravy, boy. Uh, you know, you, these guys are handing out contracts. What are you doing sitting at your ass at the, at the damn transmission shop, you know? And so um, I decided, well, hell, maybe I'll see what they'll do. And I, and I went over. This threw me, man. I went there, you know, and I've been working. I told you how long, eight, 17 years, 16. I went over and I go, okay, you got to, uh, this is your tryout match. I'm going to try out. <laughs> I started laughing. I said, hey, First of all, I was in the business before all you guys were telling me I got to try out. <laughs> so that's okay. That's what we do nowadays. I go, okay. And thank God they gave me uh, 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 Eddie Guerrero. I said, brother, they, that's another one I should have mentioned earlier. I couldn't have got a better guy to work with. I mean, he's like, and so I went, this is my tryout match, Eddie Guerrero. I said, thank you. And so we had a hell of a match. So then Bischoff coming to me and says, okay. We're going to sign you for two years, give you 150 a year. And I know you have the transmission shop. You only have to work like 10 days a month. I went, serious? I said, where's the paperwork? Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. Let's get it done. So I was all happy with it, you know, but it didn't, it didn't come through. It didn't happen. So I don't know what happened. I still don't know who said what or whatever. But after about a month and there's still – said they're getting things together. I finally went to Terry Taylor and I said, hey, brother, I got a family over there. I got a business. I said, somebody needs to get up shitter and just get something going. Or, you know, I can't just keep flying from one 
place to the next, you know, and all that. So he goes, and then after that, I got a notice and this is your last book. <laughs> and so, but before that I went to TV and um, they had me on an off TV match to answer your question. I got way off. I'm sorry. It's an off TV match. And um, so I'm talking, and this, I don't know who this guy was as a guy, maybe, you know, he's a, he's a black fellow, but he was huge. I ain't never seen a guy this big. He was, I mean, like six, seven, but he was ripped. And I don't know where he, he's like from Nigeria or something. I don't know who he was. I haven't seen him again. So I'm, they say, I'm working with him. I said, oh, shit. So I sit him down. I mean, he's a really nice guy. And I said, well, I need to, <laughs> let's talk this over. This guy's going to kill me out here accidentally, right? All of a sudden, uh, Jimmy Hart comes up and taps me on the shoulder. and goes, hey, they need to talk to you down here. I said, who does? Kevin Sullivan. And I said, oh, okay. I knew what was coming. And that's when Goldberg was on that streak where he yeah. was beating so many people. I went, oh, you got to be kidding. I said, okay, here we go. So I went down there and Goldberg sitting in a chair and they listen. We went, I said, okay. And so that's how that happened, you know? And so I worked, I went out there. It's like a squash job. I jumped him, bam, bam, bam. Here we go, jackhammer. <laughs> or give the spear, the jackhammer, and away we go, you know? Would so, you imagine back then that he'd still be main eventing uh, pay per views all this time later? No, I did. I thought he was when, after he quit there. Got whatever happened when he took off from WWE. I figured that was the end of it. You know, we started doing the the movies and trying to do the other things. But now I didn't. I didn't think he'd be back. But I didn't think he needed the money to come back. But I don't know. I don't know. Apparently, it's three million a year for three matches a year plus bonuses. So. No, yeah, that's not too bad. <laughs> you know, boss, I was in Kansas City when I did that. I think it yeah. was Kansas City, and I am not exaggerating. They had like a what, an eighteen wheeler rig, and it's, they said, "Man, they had sold out of uh, t-shirts of his that night." And they wow. had like half of that pack with his. I said, "They sold all that shit." <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So you know. I don't know what he makes on merch, too. You know, unbelievable, right? Damn. It's also an issue that they don't have any new stars, so they have to use guys like him that were older, that were over yeah. in previous eras. Yeah, they did that with Piper and all Snook and all those guys forever, trying to build up other guys, you know. And, but, yeah, they need to make – definitely get some – you know, one thing, one thing that, I mean, it's uh, – um, I don't know what your opinion, what you think about this, but uh, I I think I just wonder how this will work now. I know when we used to when I when I was working on top in the business when I was on top that we got paid by the how many people how many tickets were sold. Now right. they get paid off the TV revenue. How much money do you think they'd make if they had to go back to that with some of the talent they have now? <laughs> okay. they, we lost money on house shows before COVID the last couple of quarters. So what I'm saying, you know, so. They don't I have don't to know. draw anymore. I mean, well, they guys used to actually draw money. I'd, I'd average three grand a week in the 80s. Yeah. We would actually draw that much money. Well, we had to draw a lot of money to make that, and that was a good territory. Mid-South was on fire. But it took a lot of good workers and a lot of guys. And, you know, I don't know how that would work today, you know, how that, if they could do that or not. You know, I don't know. Do you think they'd be breaking kayfabe as much if they had to get paid off the house? Hell no, they'd be protecting the business. <laughs> or they'd starve to death. <laughs> yeah, because they want that to me the most that they possibly can, you know, because that's why, you know, people say – Brother, hey, I, I've had people, I've had guys, I've had guns pulled on me two different times. I've been, people try to cut me. I mean, man, they, hey, they believed it. And you had to be a good enough worker to make them believe it. But I'm just saying, they, you know, I wish there's 10 million more like that because I'd have made a lot more money, you know. <laughs> but that that's the way it was back then. But everything changes, I know, I understand. I just wonder if they'd be able to feed their family on what they drew. Then they'd be really concerned about getting over, you know, like you got to get over instead of like, you know, different things they do on there now. But I, I don't know because they make money from a lot of different places now. Like, hell, we didn't even get merchandise money when I was a heel. The, ba the baby faces did. <laughs> now, if you met a nice baby face, they give you a little cut of it, but not much, not many of them, you know. <laughs> 
There's a fan on here watching from Oregon, and he says, uh, any crazy stories from the Portland Territory? Oh, yeah, man, golly. All kinds of crazy stories from uh, from there. I'll tell you, the one that uh, that I always love to tell is the one about uh, Don Owens, right? The old promoter. But he was the one hell of a payoff guy. He was a good player. But um, when I first went there, you know, being from Texas, you know, and he's from Oregon, <laughs> he'd go, oh, this Texas, loudmouth Texan, that and all this bullshit. You know, and he comes up here, thinks he knows everything. He said, hell, I never had a booker. You know, and so he said, now, this is the first booker I ever hired. And so it, when he'd pay us, he'd be back in his office after the show, and all the boys would be sitting there, and, he, and every week he'd go, yeah, you know, I hired this son of a bitch over here, and he ain't sold the place out once. Roddy Piper and, uh, and Jimmy Snooker, they used to sell it out. I go, that was 10 years ago, Don. I said, <laughs> and so I said, I've only been here uh, six, you know, about four weeks. Well, hell, you, you said – all I heard was good things about you. You're going to do this, do that. He Every week, is, he didn't sell out. He didn't sell out. Finally, I got enough of that shit. I said, you know what, Don? I said, I'll tell you what. You let me do what I want to on TV. You don't let your son Barry stop me. You don't interfere. And I said, um, you give me, uh, I think it was, I said, give me six weeks on TV, and I'll sell this place out. And he, I said, if, you, if I don't sell it out, then you don't owe me shit. I'll get up, and I'll leave and go back to Texas where I belong. He goes, he got up and shook my hand in front of the boys. <laughs> and I was like, I'm thinking seriously. And while I was thinking seriously, I might have bit all more shit and I could chew here. But he didn't. He didn't bother me. And I did it. And luckily, it sold out and turned away people, right? Oh, Don was so pissed. <laughs> I've never wow. seen a promoter be pissed when the place sold out. He was mad because he lost to bed. And I, I couldn't wait to finish my shower, get over there. And I was rubbing that shit in big time to Don, man. And he was he was mad as hell because he because it's so I said, What are you mad about? He goes, Well, there's I think it turned away like six or seven hundred. He goes, there's seven hundred people ain't never gonna come back. I go, You gotta be shitting me. I said, Well, if you were a smart promoter, you might have gave him like a comeback ticket or something like you get half off. Kiss my boy, he started cussing me, kiss my ass, Lenny. But yeah, I, I love this, I love to always tell that story about Don because he got so mad. <laughs> But yeah, there's a lot of crazy stuff that happened there in Portland, though, man. You know, but uh, it was a good territory. You know, I liked working it. Rick Brooks uh, wants to know if you ever worked with Buzz Sawyer and what were your thoughts on him? <laughs> <laughs> he was known as a bit of a crazy guy as well. Yeah, I worked with Buzz Sawyer. Um, and uh, we were friends. I, I don't know why this is. But it seems like everybody that was crazy like Buzz Sawyer, for some reason, liked me. I, I, can't, I go to church and I go, all of a sudden, the guy wants to be my friend. The psycho, right? And so, but Buzz, Buzz a lot of times, he, he worked that bullshit. But he but he did, he would get crazy. But um, I remember one time, him and Matt Bourne, right? They were, they. this is back before I was even the grappler. And he had... Um, you know, Buzz had this big wrestling background from high school and college or whatever, and Matt did too. And they teamed them up in Charlotte, North Carolina, you know, the, for the Crockett's. I was working there, and they they kept hurting guys, you know, in tag matches. They had them tag, and they kept hurting everybody. was like, man, these guys, this shit and that shit. And so we were working, me and Sweet Hanson. You know what I'm talking about, Sweet Hanson? Yeah. Sweet used to be an ex-pro boxer back in his day. And so we, they they uh, they worked with Swede and somebody the night before and hurt his partner. And so this night we're in Raleigh, and and uh, no, it was you know, one of those towns. Anyway, it was me and Swede in a tag, and Swede was over there, and uh, he started taping his hands up like a boxer. And I go, I'm looking at him, and he we, he he calls the referee uh, over Tommy Young. He goes, Hey, you go over there and you tell them two greenhorn bastards just for me, okay? If they hurt Lenny or they hurt me with any of that bullshit they've been doing out there, all that suplexing or whatever they think they're doing, he said, I'm going to knock not just one, both the son of a bitches out. Okay? And he kept taping his hands up. And I tell you, ten, within 10 minutes, they were both over there going, hey, sweet buddy, look, you okay, man? I like, apologize to the sweet. That's their, that's their, yeah, they didn't want to mess with him. But see what I mean? It's like all of a sudden they, was, all of a sudden they weren't crazy no more. 
they yeah. know that can get knocked out, right? <laughs> and so that's what I'm saying. And sometimes they work that crazy stuff because they can get away with it, you know. John wants to know what was in your loaded boot. <laughs> well, I've heard everything in the world. Uh, the best one I ever heard was this. And I went, damn, you know, that might work. I, I don't know. This guy come out one time and he goes, Grappler, you son of a I know what you got in that boot. He said, you got mercury. And when you tap that toe, it warms up and all the mercury goes to one end. And then you knock the hell out of Junkyard Dog. I go, damn, that's a pretty good one. But actually, the only thing in that boot was my foot. Okay, there was nothing. <laughs> On the outside is the big heel. On the inside is the other one. So I'm I'm walking level whether you know it or not. <laughs> They're just heavier than hell. You got to keep your legs in shape to carry them around. But it's a, it got heat. It was a good gimmick. <laughs> Rick Brooks says that Jake the Snake says he invented the DDT while working a match with you. Can you confirm this story? <laughs> yeah, this, we've been doing this back and forth for years. Here, I'll tell my story again, and Jake will say, "Oh, that fat bastard's lying." All this, but here's what happened. I was working in um, Bill in Mid South. Bill Watts was like this. I came in under the hood as a grappler, and I was his wrestling heel. Okay, but wrestling, he said, at the top of the mark, he says professional wrestling. So we're going to give him wrestling on the card, and that's from you, Lenny. He said, now the top got, you know, uh, Hayes and Gordy, the Freebirds. Junkyard Dog and Robley, all them guys, they're the furniture movers. They do all the gigging and all the shit. And, uh, you know, but I need somebody that's going to be a wrestler, so that's your job. So I, he told me, I don't want you to go less than 30 minutes. I, no less, regardless of what match you're in. And so, you know, we're, it's hot. We're in Lake Charles, Louisiana. It's hot as shit. And I, we don't went about 30 minutes. And and we both, what happens, I was working a thing. Where Jake, I would do a high spot and he'd go back to the front face lock, get me back down. And then another spot, I'd get my way out of it and he'd grab the front face lock and back. So he went to grab that front face lock and we both slipped and we fell. And that, and it went boom. I mean, it's an accident. And, but the crowd popped so loud, I went, damn, did you hear that? Well, let's try it again. So we got call the spot out of it. This time he really worked it and boom, and it popped. And so um, he, I said, Jake, we did it for you know three or four more nights different shows until we've got to save that for TV. I said, man, you need to use that for a finish. That looks too impressive. And he goes, okay. And then he named, he did, and he named it and started using it and named it the DDT. And he took it from there, but that's my version. Okay. Now Jake sure is going to say he thought of it all by himself. And that's what he does. But that's what happened. <laughs> it was a total accident. <laughs> You know? Now, I, I don't know if you were married or not through most of your years as a wrestler, but I know Texas had a lot of groupies. Did the yeah. mask affect your ability to get those groupies at all since you had to uh, <laughs> your identity? I'll tell you what, brother. Okay, now, I, I don't think I've ever told this one. Okay, <laughs> Here's the thing. Um, especially when uh, uh, me and Tony, like uh, Grappler 2, were partners, yeah. but – even before but when I was just a grappler. But um, we used to go like this. This is how bad it affected me. Okay, I would go wrestle. And then as soon as we come back, you know, the big thing about wrestling is like um, in those days, your tights better be clean. You better not stink when you come in the ring because that's what we do for a living every night. So if you come in there, you get your ass whooped in the dress room for smelling bad, you know, like your tights are not clean or whatever. So as soon as we come in, Yank the tights out of the bag, wash them in the in the in the uh, sink or in, in the soap, and then uh, and hang them up and let them dry. That's the first thing you do. Put your beer on your ice. Da da da. So we do that almost every night, right? And so we we come in and get the tights. And Tony go, I got the beer. Put the cheese in the window for the rats. And so I take my loaded boot and put it in the window of the hotel, and they drive around and see that boot. Knock on the door. <laughs> Every night, put the cheese out for the rats, Lenny. <laughs> I take yeah. that big old boot, stick it in the window. That's where the grapplers are. Right. Every, every night. <laughs> and I guess not you just keep, you keep the mask on, I guess. No, well, not all the time. <laughs> not all the time. <laughs> I guess you didn't have to worry about cell phone cameras back then. No, you didn't. Oh, my God. If we, if we did, I'd really get in trouble. 
What were some of the things you did to keep your identity a secret? Well, I I, I would do um, of course when you you know try to leave a town, not everybody catch you. Go to a different store when the other guys go to to get gas or beer or whatever you're doing. All that normal kind of stuff, and but we're on the road so like every day almost. Back then when I was doing that really heavy, and so the people they couldn't. It was like you're saying it wasn't like now. It wasn't like hell. I, you, there's no way you can do it nowadays. There, ain't, I don't know how you would, unless you wore it 24 seven. Tell somebody to catch you. You know what I mean? But back then it was easier to do. You know what I mean? Michael Collins says Raven has spoken highly about you as a mentor. Do you keep in touch with him, and do you re feel responsible for any of his his success? Uh, I um, I don't keep it that close in touch with him, but every now and then I hear from him. But uh, he was uh, he came in, and, and, and me and Piper actually put him on the show and tested. He did a good job. I, I tried my best to to help him out, and you know he was. He was hard to get to at first because he had such an ego, but then he learned and he changed a lot. You know, he changed a whole lot. And then he started getting good good at what he does, you know. There's a fan on here that wants to know, in your opinion, who are some of the guys Greg Gagne could have beat in a shoot? <laughs> could have beat in a shoot? Yeah. Well, he still couldn't beat his dad. <laughs> it was what I'm saying he was, um, you know, I, I was, I was only, I tell you, I worked with Greg Gagne one time, and that was in St. Louis, and uh, it was in a tag. I never was around him. I don't think he was a big shooter. Not by any of the guys from many Minnesota that I know told me, <laughs> you know, like, uh, like uh, Rick Rude and, and Scott Norton and and the Road Warriors and John Nord were all friends of mine. I don't think he could have took none of those guys. <laughs> And so I don't really know many guys. Could. I know one thing. When I went in the ring in St. Louis, I went like this. And I was only joking, but I was just messing with Tony. I thought the guy would laugh. And it's when him and Brunzel with him, the flying or jumping, whatever, something, right? Yeah, the high flyer. And, I, and so then I go like this. I go, I said, um, what is the guy that uh, – the guy that um, Lawler dropped on his head? Andy Kaufman. I said, I said, I go, so they go to read the bell, and I, I, I kind of threw my hands and come on, I'm going to fight. I, go, I told the referee, get this Andy Kaufman looking bastard away from me. A joke. He, he, he got so pissed. He, he wanted to fight me. I said, calm down, motherfucker. It's a joke. I don't like you calling me that shit. <laughs> of, oh, course we call, of course, we called him that the rest of the match then, you know, both of us. <laughs> but, yeah, he, he didn't like me saying that, but that's the only kind of – Thing I've ever even that's the only time I was around him really much. Got yeah, one little thing in St. Louis. Dan Masters is back here. He wants to know if you have any memories of Ole Anderson. Of Ole? <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. that piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. Now Ole was Ole was a hard ass on everybody, man. You know? And um he he uh he was the same way he was the same way with me too. You know, everybody he didn't give nobody a break. He, uh, him and Watts screwed me over. Watts got pissed because I worked a show for my dad in Texas, and it was close to his, where his TV came in. And so I'm leaving, going there to Charlotte, and they made this big story up about they were going to give me a push in Charlotte. And I, and then Ole, they start, starved me out of there. All kinds of things. He's getting stories from everybody you talk to, and none of them's good. But, uh, yeah, Ole was, uh, he was a one of a kind, man. I laughed my ass off one time because we had, you know, like not, like in Texas now, a big snowstorm. They had yeah. one like that, that in Atlanta, Georgia, right? And I'm working there. And every Monday we used to go get our check. And that's when he worked for Barnett, you know, Jim Barnett. <laughs> and so, and Ole was the booker. And he goes, um, so everybody, they couldn't go get their check. It snowed so bad you couldn't drive over there. And so, um, so he goes, so like, like I think it was like Tuesday or Wednesday, we made some show. We're doing a show and a spot show. And he said, hey, did you, did you get your check? Did you, did you guys go by Monday, you know, to get your check and stuff like that? Because it was locked up. So, yeah, yeah, we went by a couple of us and said, they had a note out there. It said, uh, pick up your check. So the show Wednesday, but it was written in the snow, and it was in uh, it was in uh, uh, Barnett's Piss and always handwriting. 
<laughs> That's how much the boys thought all the way, okay? <laughs> yeah. How is it in Houston now, anyways? Is it any better? Yeah, yeah, it's clearing off now. Yeah. It's just that it's just that the water, you gotta boil the water and all this. I don't know what to deal with the water issue, but everything was screwed. That screwed everything up. And then they're, they're coming down on them about the the electrical grid wasn't even up to date, it hadn't been up to date for a hundred years. But they've been really taking all the taxpayers' money, you know, <laughs> charging the hell out of everybody. So I don't know, man, what's gonna come down on that. But everything's yeah. going back to normal now. Yeah. Oh, I'm coming back there next week, so I hope it's better. Yeah, it should be. On, on the plane uh, today, they were going, guys, I, can I get a Coke? Well, we don't have Coke. We're out of Coke. We got to, all this stuff, we're out of a lot of stuff because Houston just had a bad week. That's what they said. We got deliveries on nothing. <laughs> so by the time you go, it'll be probably straight now, yeah. Ivan Santos wants to know how was working with Bruiser Brody. Stiff. Stiff, <laughs> but no, Frank was a good friend of mine, but Frank was this type of guy. You know you're going to get hit hard, and if you don't like it, then you're in the wrong business the way he looked at it. You know, I, one time I remember Frank, you know, he, uh, we're on Dallas on TV, and they said, well, you got Brody. Brody was the booker, so he goes, you got me tonight. I go, <laughs> let me guess, Frank, shoot him in, big boot to the fucking head, one, two, three, I dropped the leg. One, two, he goes, you got it. And so he goes off, right? And so I'm sitting there thinking, so, you know, I know what's going to happen. Frank's just going to beat the hell out of me and then pin me. I said, hell with this. Because I ain't never seen nobody do that. I don't know what made me think I could do this. But Frank come in. They rang about. I attacked Frank, locked him. We backed him in the corner. And I chopped him like five times as hard as I could. And back then I was in pretty good shape. Hard as I could in the chest. He, he's, he's, he's taking, he's looking at me like, what is wrong with this fucking guy? So finally, he, he knocks the shit out of me. He's blocking, get me. And he gets a headlock and took me over. And he said, call high spark. And he wrestled a match with me like he was a guy my size. And he went ahead and had the match. We did high spots. And then when I come to the back, he goes, you know why I worked with you? Because you had balls enough to stand up. Everybody else just lays down. That's the way Frank was right there, you know? You know, How did you take his uh, death when you heard about that tragedy that took place? Oh, brother, I uh, I, I hated it. Just like everybody, I hated it. But um, I know how Puerto Rico was. And, um, you know, it's like uh, they – it's kind of their own country, you know. It's, so, I mean, I don't know the whole situation was going on around that deal. But uh, I sure did hate because Frank was, he was a friend of my dad's. You know, he knew my dad before he knew me. And, and we were friends. And we weren't real close, close. But I hate to see anything happen like that to a friend of mine, you know. But, um, that, yeah, it was the shits, I thought, you know. I, I know his wife was, his wife, he left, and she's so nice and so friendly, you know. It's like, I hate to see that happen, you know. She's too nice, unfortunately, to fight very much for justice, though. She probably could have uh, fought a little harder for justice. But yeah, yeah. Who knows? You have a female fan watching, Tracy. She wants to know if you ever wrestled in Hawaii for Leah Maivia. <laughs> yeah, I did. I wrestled um, a bunch of times. Actually, we were the – I was a heavyweight – Hawaiian heavyweight champion one time, but um, – uh, let's see, I forget what year it was, but and then me and Tony went over there and we wrestled tag team together to grapple too a bunch of times. We wrestled in the Hula Bowl in Hawaii when they, you know, with the Japanese office and stuff like that. And um, yeah, a lot of times I worked for me, Leah. A few people have been asking if you ever wrestled in Japan. Yeah, I wrestled three different tours. Two for Nokia, one for a, a company called Wings. Back okay, in, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Victor Kionis ran that, I think. Yeah, he? yeah, Victor. Yeah, I got some heat because I was supposed to go to Korea, but I didn't go. Oh, I, had okay. a, I had a thing come up in, with a, my old lady, of course. <laughs> and so I had, to, I, I had to go home, you know. Karma wants to know if you have any Billy Jack Haynes stories. Uh, he's always a popular subject on this channel. 
Oh, I know, brother. Yeah, me and Billy, we we worked a lot together. Uh, I tell you, it was um, was one. That, yeah, I laughed, but it wasn't funny at the time. But I was, I'm working with him in a match, and me and Billy in in Portland at Sports Arena, and he takes me and he slams me, and I'm looking around. I don't see where he, most guys slam me, and they call. Okay, watch the knee, watch the elbow, watch the whatever, right? But uh, he just all of a sudden, look, I can't find him. So I start to get up like this in my right elbow, as I get, and I lean in my left hand. I start standing up, and he was coming off with a punch off the top rope, and my elbow caught him right in the mouth and knocked his front teeth out. And he rolls oh. over, he rolls over into the into the corner, and I look at him like that. And he sits down, and he looks at me, and I swear he looked he looked like a pumpkin. He had no his two front teeth were missing, and big old cut on my elbow. And so we go and finish the match, and then he's all pissed. I said, I didn't mean to do it. You should have called, told me what you're doing. I didn't even see you come. So so uh, I was in a hurry, of course, to go out and drink, and I just washed it off with soap. What a mistake that was. My elbow was huge the next day. I had to go get, oh, man. That's the worst thing in the world, too, by, uh, a bite from somebody or something like that. I learned that lesson, Harry. <laughs> Carol, you want to go immediately and get a shot. I guess some, um, you know. Yeah. But, but um, anyway, that was that was kind of a thing that happened, and a lot of different things. And Billy, we worked a bunch of times around there, you know, all over. I worked a lot with him in Florida too. Now he he says himself that he was a big time drug dealer back then. Is that is that him telling stories, or do you actually believe that uh, he was a drug I, dealer on the side? He he might have he might have done some of that, but I don't. I mean, I never seen seen it. I did it, and I didn't ever see any drugs with him, and I didn't ever see him heard of him selling any either. You know, um, and I'll be honest, I ain't no angel. I probably would have known. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> so I didn't hear nothing. You know, so I don't know. Dynamite Kid was also popular in the uh, Oregon territory. Did you have much contact with him over the years? He was. Um, I met him in over in Europe in Germany. Uh, that's the first time I met him. He he'd already worked Portland, I guess. And then we got to be friends over there. And then I went to uh, Calgary to work for Stu Hart, and it was there about a year. And then Dynamite was in and out of there. And uh, yeah, it was. So I, that was the relationship I had. Then after that, um, I seen him in we're in Japan together one time, and that was it. That was it. You know. What was he like in those days? Was that before he kind of became a bully, or was he still pretty reserved when you knew him? No, he he was a. Uh, I mean, I always respected him. He was he he had he didn't fear anybody, and he was a good athlete, stayed in shape. And um, but um, I, I mean, I wasn't. I never was around him trying to bully somebody. Really, you know. I mean, he's. I see. He stood up for me before. When guys were like trying to pull something they shouldn't, and uh, we always got along. I mean, you have to judge somebody by the way they treat you. That's what I do. So I mean, I know. I heard stories about him too. I I don't sound like the guy I knew, you know. But I don't know, you know. Were you ever attacked by fans? Oh yeah, you know. I've had, well, actually, with Dynamite, we had a riot, a couple of riots over there in Canada, and over there they ain't got much security, and you're on your own, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time. This is no bullshit. What is it Red Deer Canada? And they start hitting the ring. Yeah. And I'm like, damn, we're just trying to get to the dressing room. And we're trying to keep people back. And we finally get to it. And we're holding the door. There's no security. We're holding the door with our shoulder. And it's like like you see in a movie. Like they're trying to knock the door down. And they keep boom. And boom, we're holding the door. And finally, I said, Dynamite goes, I swear, he went like this. Hey, Mike. I said, what? He goes, we got to go back out there. He said, we forgot to challenge him for next week. I'm like, fuck you, dude. I ain't going back out there. <laughs> Finally, they quit kicking at the door and left, and we got we got out of there. But, but yeah, I've, I've had a lot of that. <laughs> back, in, back in the day, they would – you never know when one's coming at you, you know. And the security, it wasn't that good, you know. <laughs> Just guys that get hired for nothing. Yeah, well, on Stampede, I highly doubt they ever paid for security unless the arenas made them. Sure, no, man, Stu, oh, God, it's crazy. I, yeah. I wrestled there, too. Oh, uh, did you? 
There's a fan asking uh, who's tougher, t- Texas or Japan wrestlers? I'll say Texas. Texas or J- Japanese wrestlers? Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> well, I uh, I know that uh, that uh, what I didn't appreciate was this: they take you, you know, in Japan, and you put you on the bus, make you get up at six o'clock in the morning, and drive all day, and then uh, and then you get out and go wrestle and you set the bus and sometimes don't you get stopped for food and they have to wrestle and, and all that when the other guy that you get to the guys are already there i mean they they took care of the japanese guys but the americans like they run them ragged expect them to you know compete is just as hard as those guys but as far as the toughest guys I, I i don't i don't know i was i would think of course i'm american i'd say texas right but yeah. uh, i'm sure there's plenty of tough japanese guys <laughs> You know, Lewis wants to know if you have any stories about Adrian Street. Not too much about Adrian. You know, I never worked with him much at all. I mean, I've seen him on, you know, different shows, but yeah. I never was, I never was around him with it. I know his gimmick and all that stuff, but no, I, I, we never even traveled together once that I know of. I don't remember. Did you ever work with Ric Flair? Yes. Yeah. I, worked with, I did a thing with Ric Flair. But my big thing with Rick was I drove Rick for a year. Oh, were, wow. Yeah. And you're alive to tell about it. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, what happened was he lost his driver's license when I was in Charlotte. And they told him, go pick one of those rookies to drive you. And for some reason, he picked me, which was God bless him because, you know, I got to ride, drive with him and listen and get, you know, like he was, they were priming him for the world title at the time. He wasn't the world champion yet, but he was drawing like hell. So I was in every show I went to, it was sold out. And uh, I was on like the first match. And then I get to talk, well, I'd, I'd ask, you know, pick Rick's brain about interviews and all these kinds of things while I was young. And he really helped me come along, you know, into business. It helped me a lot. Yeah. What do you think about this claim that, that he's had sex with 10,000 women that he makes? Is that possible? Well, from driving with him a year, you would. What on average in a day would he have sex with in a year? Brother, I, I was with him for a year, and uh, he he was like uh, he was everything was moving too fast. I mean, I I didn't stay in his room. I'd have my own room, and I and I remember times when we go back to the room, he had two girls with him, and I'd say, "Hey, we're drinking," and I'd take off back to my room or whatever. So I don't know if he got if he nailed both of them or not, but. Um, I, I know he had no problem in that area, but I don't think ten thousand, a hundred thousand, or whatever he's saying. You know, is he no. just that charming that like he'll walk into a store, a restaurant, and like he'll be able to pick a girl up right away? Yeah, he didn't hurt this money he was spending too. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that round for everybody here, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, that'll attract him for sure. Yeah. Um, Arturo wants to know your thoughts on Gino Hernandez. Yeah. Well, G- uh, Gino was a very good worker, good talker. He had everything he took. Um, he just I, – he really did get caught up in the drug thing. You know, he, and so I – that was uh, Gino's problem, you know. And he, he, did, he had more on it. He was making more money uh, that wrestling was a secondary thing to him. You know, he didn't care if he's booked or not. He just did it for fun, but he was very good at it, you know. And he wanted to think about it and do it, you know. But he he wasn't planning on making a living being a wrestler. Gino wouldn't. I don't know if you ever wrestled Lanny Poffo or not, but there's a couple of fans on here asking if you ever saw him do his little party trick that he used to do in the dressing rooms from time to time. One time and almost threw up. <laughs> oh, my God, that's sick. Yeah, I see. I wrestled Lenny Poffo, <laughs> Macho Man's brother. <laughs> and the, I seen his trick one time in Louisville, Kentucky. And I went, You got to be kidding me. I couldn't believe it. I said, Hey, fuck that. That's sick shit, man. <laughs> he just does it. Like, he just whips it out in the dressing yeah, room. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel yeah, like that's going to get over, brother. <laughs> were, you, were you ever a baby face at all, or were you mostly always a heel? No, I would. I've worked, baby. I, when I first started, I was, but you know, I looked a lot different. When I was young, but but even 
once I got to where I knew how to work and stuff, I did, but I just, no matter what I do, I can't get over his baby face. I am a shitty baby face. I was made to be a heel. Okay. <laughs> because, I mean, they can give me the biggest push in the world. People go, yeah, but, yeah okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't know why. I just, no matter what I do, it won't, you know, it's, I, I don't even feel good doing it. You know what I mean? That's just not me, you know. I'd rather be out there thinking the match a different way, you know. Do you have any advice for heels out there? Because I know a lot of wrestlers watch these interviews. Well, I just they, it's okay to you know you need to know all the stuff, the bumps and the holes and all. But the main thing about it is the psychology, the reason why. Okay, when I used, one thing I used to do is this. And and I, and this used to go a long ways. I'd go if I'm working with you tonight, or I'm working with this guy over here. I would look at you and go, okay, well, what attributes has he got? What can I make shine? What can I take advantage of? I know he does well, and it, it, he, it, he automatically will do it good. So okay, let's see. So I'll start there. What do I need to stay away from that he don't do with shit? What what do I do? What do I do that, that I I don't do good? I should stay away. So I build that around the match. Now I work with Andre a different way than I work with you. I work with you a different way. I work with Junkyard Dog because you all got something different, right? So, but have matches like that. Use your brain psychology instead of just go, okay, we got to go out and do this hospital, that hospital. Wait a fucking minute. This guy's six foot six. I'm five foot ten. I don't think I should be throwing around like that. It don't make no sense. If we're in the street, that would happen. Right. Let's try to half ass. You know, fool the people. Let's don't just, you know, like if they came here to see acrobats, hell yeah. But let's try to make it look like he's real anyway. So they go, hey, that motherfucker really did throw him at time. Or, you know, he 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 did this or like you know, say say it's your size, okay? If I wanted to stop you, hurt you, I wouldn't walk up and just punch you, expect you to fall down. You know, right. like I had to do something. Where you, you're not looking. At I cheat my ass. I'll hit you in the nuts. Or okay, now motherfucker, right like that, right? They don't think that. They think, well, just do that same old thing. You got to work. You got to figure what you're working with. You know what I mean? And go from there. You know. There's a bunch of fans on here that are asking about your tag team with the dirty white boy when he was the second grappler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. Well, he uh, Tony. We were the grapplers first, and then we then after that, uh, Jimmy Hart. We left Memphis uh, territory, and, we, and when. Uh, and then they wanted to bring us back, and they said, "Hey, Jimmy Hart came up with this idea of the Dirty White Boys," and so we did that gimmick for a while. Then went to Louisiana with it for a while. Then back to the Grapplers again. Just anything to keep ourselves booked, you know. Did you ever work for Bill Watts? I know you worked for Leroy. Oh, yeah, but... Mid yeah, Mid South. That was Bill Watts. Yeah, yeah. I what was the difference Watts. between the two bookers there? Bill Watts and who? Oh, you mean like when? Like, uh, at first it was Leroy, then Leroy McGurk, then it seemed Bill Watts took over. Well, Leroy was uh, from old, old school, right? And whenever uh, whenever he was there, when I went in the first time, it was Jody Hamilton, the assassin, was a booker. Watts was a part owner, half owner, and Leroy on the other half. That's for Watts on the whole thing. The first time I went in, it was Jody Hamilton. The second time I went in, it was Buck Robley. When I went in, they made the grappler gimmick, you know? That's how they got started with Robley. You trained a lot of wrestlers over the years, too, didn't you? Yeah, I saw me. I trained a bunch of guys, but um, different guys, yeah. Is there anyone that you're most uh, proud of training that you consider kind of a protege? Well, the one guy, but he never he went he went to Oregon, and he stayed his whole career with Don Owens for like five or six years, and then he quit and got out. This guy named Joey Como who wrestled as gorgeous Joey Jackson. He he was very very good worker, and uh, it was still is. And then um, uh, I I tell you who would, I, I was I was asking a friend of mine about tonight was a, a Colton a Roddy Piper's boy. I trained him. And, uh, and you know, but I don't know. I guess he's not pursuing it anymore. And I haven't heard of him. So I'm, yeah. I'm never, you know? Well, I actually interviewed uh, Teal, of course, uh, recently. Yeah. We, we were just talking about, and she said he kind of didn't go the positive route when uh, Roddy passed away. It kind of, kind of took away some of his motivation. 
yeah. one of the goals he was going after. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I tried to call him, honestly, a few times. He calls me Uncle Lenny, okay? I tried to call him and text him, and it was very strange he hasn't answered me back, you know? I just, it makes me worry about him, is what I'm saying. Yeah, well, when I when I see his sister next week, I'll uh, please ask her to tell him to get in contact. Yeah, I will. I, I will bring that up for you. Thank Greg you. wants to know if you were ever around the original Sheik. Uh, yeah, well, I was some some in Hawaii one time. In Hawaii, was there, dude, for a week when we we're doing shows together. Um, I was with him some in Houston with Paul Bosch, but never on the road or anything like that, you know, because he was just in and out. Fonzie wants to know if you ever wrestled the junkyard dog. Fonzie from Florida? I think it's just a fan that's using okay. the name. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I wrestled, yes, I wrestled the junkyard dog many times. Yeah, I sure did, many times. How was he in the ring? I, I know he was over like crazy, but a lot of people he say was he was over. There's a perfect example right there, boss. Is dog, you know, he had his things he could do good, but he wasn't a great worker. But he was over like a million dollars. So you take advantage of his good points and you stay away from his bad ones, okay? <laughs> and so that's how you work a match with him. And when I had dog, I'd go like, oh, shit. Some people are almost like pulling teeth. They go, okay, I'm going to, I got I know it's going to be harder. It wasn't like working with Rick Martell or somebody like that. But you could have a good match. I, I remember Doug, whenever it, I've seen matches on tape, he was laying the clotheslines in so hard, he shot me in. And I come running, and you see me turn where he hit me in the back. So I, said, I figured he's going to catch me, and John knocked me out. I told him to do spin in the air like that before I get to him. Because I know at least he ain't going to knock me out. He was hitting so hard, I couldn't take it no more. I go, damn, brother, loosen up, you know? But, you know, he. I always got along with him. He go, I'm, oh, sorry, brother. Sorry, brother. <laughs> half, the shit, half of it did. You could tell it wasn't like malicious. He wasn't trying to hurt you. It's just he was just all wound up. I go, calm down, brother. You know, because the people yeah, are all going to touch you. Know, so, <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't a day off, believe me. <laughs> but you know what? He made money with the guy, you know. Trev Clark wants to know how you came up with the name The Grappler. Well, I was. Um, well, in Charlotte at the time when it, whenever uh, the flare thing, you know, and then every now and then flare go, well, he's flying out of town and stuff like that, so I'd be on my own. And I was riding with a fellow named Don Cranoodle. He was a worker, Don Cranoodle. And, yeah. uh, okay, and he was a big uh, uh, Greco-Roman wrestler and all that in college, and he was really good. But Don was funny as hell, and we were good friends. And we, we were just riding, you know, back from a show one night and he goes, uh, we were talking about, you know, if I ever get a break, if I ever get, you know, and rest, he goes, I like to wear a mask one day, he says. And he goes, I said, what'd you see? I said, I never done, I, I did a little bit, but I don't like it that much. He goes, well, I said, what would you call yourself? He said, I'll call myself the grappler because the grappler in Greek means wrestler. I go, really? <laughs> so the next day I get a call from Buck Robley in Louisiana. He goes, we need a wrestler here. We need a wrestling heel. We heard you a wrestling heel. I said, yeah, I am. He goes, and we heard you wear the mask. I said, yeah. He goes, what do you call yourself? I went, the grappler. That's exactly, I just remember what he said. <laughs> that's exactly how it started. I said, he goes, that's a pretty good name. Okay, we'll call you the grappler. And he said, so they then they, <laughs> they give me a starting date. He said, I'll call Crockett because you're just doing jobs over there anyway. And so that's how that all happened. And Don Cradle still tells me when he sees me, you owe me so much money in residuals for stealing my name, boy. <laughs> he still tells me that. <laughs> you were the uh, booker in Portland for a while, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. whole time I was there, five years. Yeah. How did you get that role? Was that off of the story you told earlier where you ended up selling out the house and then they just kept you I going? Was, uh, I was uh, booking uh, books for Harley Race and Bob Geigel. And Bob Geigel was a good friend of Don Owens and Harley Race. And so I went to – when I was done in for Fritz over in Dallas, right, uh, I'd been there about a year, and it was time for me to go. And uh, and so uh, uh, Cuban assassin Dave Sarah, 
He's a good friend of mine. He was working up there, and we're talking on the phone almost every day. He said, hey, you should come over here. I said, man, I don't know about it. Anyway, so they got to talking, and, and that's when Vince hired Rip Oliver to come to WWE, and Rip was running it for Don. He said, hey, there's a booking job. So it all started, and it's talked for me, and that's how I ended up getting that job. Yeah, like and that. Of course, uh, Rip passed away a little less than a year ago. Any thoughts yeah. on him? Yeah, Rip was one hell of a guy. He's a good friend. And yeah, I love Rip. We made we were tag team partners in Florida together. We're champions there. We, were, we worked all over the country. We broke in. We were both broke in about the same time. We we're rookies in this business together. I know him a long time, you know. He's a great guy, man. We got the SWE Fury Wrestling TV show checking in, saying hi, Lenny. Hey, buddy. How you doing? <laughs> You like what they're trying to build in Texas uh, with SWE? The no, I, really, I really do. There's some good guys, some great guys there, and they, they got their heart in. Those guys, man, they worked their ass off over there trying to keep that show together. It's a lot of work, I know. And, uh, yeah, I am. I'm proud of them, man. I, I hope – I wish them the biggest and the best they can do, man, because they're giving a lot of guys work that would have work. And it's also – they're using talent from all over, and, and, it's, and it's getting over, you know. It's getting over because uh, they're getting to see stuff they don't see with WWE, you know. As a booker, uh, I mean, SWE is going the opposite direction. They're going old school, but you watch the television wrestling now, and it's it's pretty hard to watch for the most part. Do you yeah. think anything could be done to, to save it, or do you think it's just going to keep going that direction and maybe other territories are going to pop up? I think that it's going to keep going that direction because – as long as as long as uh, the sponsors, the, 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 like uh, this the, paying vents, you're paying the TV time, and all those people are happy with what's going on, they're going to keep pushing in that direction. As soon as they, they're not going to try to go back to supporting wrestling. You know, they're, they're just all about networking TV and, and money off TV time, which is a good thing to have. But it's like when it comes to wrestling, it's not going to. You know, and, and it's so hard to compete with them because they got so much money already in it and already backing it. You know, you'd have to have a guy, even a guy, what's that? I can't think, never think of the name of that promotion. Khan. The one that owns the football team? Yeah, you know, or Shad Khan or something like that. Like, yeah, even him with that money, I don't know, you know, if, if he's going to even come close to where Vince is at, you know what I mean? Because he's got so many sponsors and stuff and connections. And before, he had that shit before he started running that, you know, so he's got, he's so far in advance, but I don't know. I know there's market for the old school type stuff there. That's all you hear people talk about. It. You know what I mean? Rob Moore is watching. He says, good to see you. Hey, Rob. Another, an, another fan wants to know if you ever fought George the Animal Steel. I never did. No, I heard a million things about him. And this never came up this way to wrestle in New York for Vince, you know. Did you ever work Mil Mascaris? Yes, sir, I did, yeah. A few times. What was that experience like? Well, the, the last time I worked when we got a shoot out there in San Antonio, he got to take my mask off, and I'm trying to take his mask off. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. But, you know, he, he came in. That was whenever it was Southwest Championship Wrestling. Tully Blanchard and his dad, and Tully books me against Mill. They're pushing me as the top mask guy, and they bring in Mill Maskers and put us together, which is the top mask guy in Mexico, and they asked Mill to do a job for me. He said, no. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm not doing one for him either. I'm trying to get over. He said, well, you guys go through. So we went 20 minutes through, and, and like two minutes before the match is over, he started trying to take my mask off on a shoot. Well, then it broke into a shoot then. You know, because you blush. And so, anyway, it was just crazy, you know. Is that the only time that it went into a shoot? Yeah, that was the only time. The other times I worked with him and had my good, you know, okay match, you know. I see. Todd says, I guess you might have a story about this. He wants to know about the time you had to let Billy Jack go from Portland Wrestling. <laughs> Todd, I know who that guy is. He goes, I forget. Let's see what happened. Something happened. Billy did. Don Owens 
got pissed off. And when, I, and when I come into the arena that night, he goes, come here. He calls me in the office. He says, I want you to go over there. It's before TV starts. I want you to tell Billy Jack to get his bag and get his ass out of here. He's fired. I, <laughs> I go, Dice, you're the booker. Asshole, go do it. It's your job. That's the way Don would talk to you. You know, he's been around. He's like almost 80 years old. I go, okay. So I'm thinking on the way over there, how am I going to tell this guy this without him beating the shit out of me? You know, because he's a big old tough son. And I'm like, you know, I go, well, I don't think no way around it. We're going to get into it probably. So hell with it. I've already, I've already settled it. You know, whatever happens, happens, but I got to do this. So I got in there and I go, hey, uh, you know, here's all the boys. You know, you can imagine me walking. Go, hey, listen, I need to talk to you in, in the back. <laughs> Everybody stops. Oh, shit. Right. So Billy's like, what? I said, you heard? Come here. So I take him back there. I said, look, okay. But I learned, okay, a long time ago, the old Booker man, listen, brother, this ain't coming from me. That damn Piper and that Don Owens, them sorry bastards, they want me to let you go. <laughs> I put all the right back on Don, right back on Roddy, because Roddy was helping run the territory. <laughs> right back on them. And got it. He goes, and I said, and they don't even want you. You know what? Those assholes don't even want you to hang around for the show. You need to get your stuff and go. The old man's going off up there. He goes, oh, that. But he grabs his <laughs> and he takes off. I went, got away with that one. <laughs> All right, wow. first match. Come here. <laughs> yeah, I know. But that's what I did. That's how I got out of it. getting into a fist fight over. If I went in there and said, hey, listen, man. You screwed up. It's like it was my idea. It wasn't my idea to fire him start with. But he, <laughs> it would have broke out in something for no reason. You know what I mean? But I just worked it. Do you yeah. have any stories about uh, John Nord? There's a fan asking. Yeah. My brother, me and Johnny did so much crazy bullshit I can't even tell. We get arrested. <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> I, I swear. But, uh, Johnny. Well, he's sadly been arrested a lot lately. Yeah, I know. I think he's in there now. I think he's in there now. But uh, you know, I ne here's here's how we used to drink like crazy men, right? And uh, and I remember one time we and and the guy you never believe this, the guy that was working at the gym, <laughs> the guy that was working at the gym was Collins, the Undertaker. Before he got wrestling, he was like six foot ten and. Real skinny, right? And uh, he was a basketball player at the college here in Fort Worth. And so <laughs> me and Nord are in there working out. And he comes over to me and he asked me, could I train him? And I go, brother, we're on the road every day. And I sent him over to where he got trained at with Gary Hart and, and, and Agbar and those guys. But anyway, he was in there that day. And me and Nord are hung over. I mean, we're hammered, hung over. And we're doing, we're sitting on the, on the, um, on the ground, on the mat carpet. And we're doing uh, pull downs, right? With the lap, lap machine. We're doing a lap machine. So we're so high over. I do a set of eight and I roll over and go, just, I would just roll over and once I'd be like, and, and in order to get at me, do one, he would roll over. <laughs> we wasn't even sitting up in the seat. And so we're trying to get through this. Finally, I swear about it, after about five cents, Nord rolls over and he goes, he's got that big old beard and he goes, and just pukes everywhere. And, and he, <laughs> I go, what the? F he gets <laughs> and he gets up and on his hands and knees, and everybody's looking at him in the gym. He's got puke dripping over his beard. He goes, it had no. I swear, he goes, had nothing to do with the beer. <laughs> I go, you crazy <laughs> bastard! Let's get out of here, man. And uh, Collins is watching. He goes, oh my god, so you want to be one of these, huh? <laughs> And they ended up, uh, those two ended up feuding in WWE. <laughs> yeah. Strangely yeah. enough. Did you have much contact with Jesse Ventura? Not much at all, no. No, I mean, I've met him, but that's about it. I never was really around him. What about Manny Fernandez? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot. A lot of that crazy guy. <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of matches with Manny in, in um, Southwest Championship Wrestling. Matter of fact, I went a week around the loop with him in Bob Wire matches. Holy cow. That's crazy, man. But yeah, I worked a lot with Manny. Because Sully so Blanchard was scared to work with him. <laughs> but um, but yeah, we I mean we got along. 
Yeah, I was in Japan with Manny too. We got along, but you know, Manny was a, he gave me the worst black eye I've ever had in my life. I never really? forget. He was, stick, he was sticking out of the mask this far. They took a picture for the program in his <laughs> They couldn't believe it. And, uh, but same thing. He did the same thing. He slammed me, went to the top rope, didn't say nothing. I'm looking, all of a sudden, I started to get up and he caught his elbow right here by. You know, he didn't say anything. Same thing happened to Billy Jack. But luckily, this time it wasn't my turn to get hurt. You know? We, we brought up Raven earlier saying you're one of his mentors. Eric wants to know if you have any stories about riding in the car with him or, or anything in particular you could remember about Raven. Yeah, we used to go down. Raven, we made a lot of trips together, you know, Raven and, and me. And uh, we used to make a lot of long trips and, and, um, and laugh and talk about wrestling and do things. And I remember him. Um, we used to get busted. He he had a van and he would always – we'd have his TV going. I remember cops pulled us over a couple of times because you weren't supposed to watch, you know, in the back. So okay. <laughs> we always had it going in the front. But, but yeah, like uh, we just, you know, the same old thing as everybody else. Up down the highway, making the trips and stuff like that, you know. What was Chris Adams like? Chris is, I got along with Chris, but um, we never hung out a lot. I remember one time we were in Boston and we went to a bar. He said, I was there in, in, in the uh, city, we we're staying over. And he goes, I said, Where, where are you guys go drink? He said, Well, and I, I forget the name of the street, it's where they get out and they fist fight each other at this bar. They, and when it closes, you know. There's a certain street there. I don't know the name of it in Boston, right? And I, I said, what are you talking about? I never heard this. There really is. So we went there, and, and I swear, the closing time, the bars the bars start empty, and guys start taking fist fight. And went, what in the hell's wrong with these people? <laughs> this It's like legendary in Boston, okay? And I, I couldn't believe it was true. But Chris really? was good. I got, yeah, I got, I, I got along with Chris good. You know, we had good matches and all. I, you know, but I, I wasn't around him a whole lot, you know. You know, just we off and on different territories a little bit, you know, but not not a, a lot, you know. Was was Steve Austin around you much over the years? No, no, not not really. I don't think – he was in Dallas, but he left before I come in. And I didn't see him. I wasn't around him much at all, no. There's a fan here that wants to know who is the hardest wrestler to deal with as a booker in Portland. Thanks for all the entertainment you gave us. <laughs> the hardest guy. Uh, the hardest guy. The hardest one would have been uh, Don Owens. <laughs> was the hardest one, okay? But um, as far as the boys, uh, I think um, – who was giving me headaches over – Sometimes it was Billy Jack. He was hard. You know, he wanted to do certain things. But then uh, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. He was uh, from Australia. He was one of the Bushwhackers before. Tom. Jonathan Boyd. He was hard. Oh. He was a hard one sometimes because he always had his own ideas. And I go, yeah, but you're not the booker. So we're doing it this way. And he didn't like that, you know. <laughs> what about Art Bar? Was he easy to deal with? Yeah, it was very easy. We, he he was a good worker too. Art was. He's just small, but Piper gave me a gimmick. He really got over Beetlejuice gimmick and all that. Yeah. The name Hugo Savinovich has come up a few times. Did you feud with him or something, or, or wrestle yeah. him ever? The Puerto Rican announcer. Was he the guy? Was in, I was working Japan for or something? I don't know. Remember? I remember the name, but I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't remember a problem with him or nothing. Did you have much interaction with Haku? Uh, some. I knew Haku, but never. I never got no fights or nothing with him. I, I know him and I worked in battle royals and stuff like that, you know. But I was good friends with uh, his partner, you know, uh, the Barbarian. Okay. We were good friends and stuff, so I knew him through him, you know. Was the Barbarian as tough as everyone says he was? Oh, yes, he was. He was, <laughs> yeah. He's a tough one, yeah. Do you have any social media or anything where fans can follow you if they want to look you up? Yeah, brother. You can go to. Uh, I got an Instagram. I got a. Uh, I, I tell you where, where they need to go. 
it's to uh, eBay and check my, it's called the real grappler because I'm selling stuff on eBay and then uh, Amazon I have my books on selling Amazon or they can go through my eBay to probably get it cheaper. Plus I'll personally sign it for them and all that, you know? And what's your book called for people that want to look it up on Amazon called, and get it? It's called memoirs, memoirs of a mask madman. I'll sh let's see if I can show you here. Yeah, pull it up and put it on the screen. There you go, boss. Cool. Okay. Okay. Got it? Yeah. Hey, that's, what's that sound? What the hell is this? What is this? Captain Hannibal, here we go. I didn't recognize you with that man bun instead of the captain hat again. Oh, well, I don't need the captain hat because guess what? I want everyone to see the man bun of gold back here, okay? I want everyone to see it. I want everyone to enjoy and appreciate it. Why you should oil one of his masks. It would be a great improvement. Oh, oh, that's rich coming from you, Hannibal, Mr. Jigsaw, okay? This is the money maker. You need to stick to, to stay in the ring because this is what makes me the money. This is what makes the captain the money, okay? <laughs> well, you got something to the say, word, Yes, I do. The word is today is going all over the country, brother. Don't fuck with the grappler. Beat me if you can. And don't fuck with the captain, Hannibal. That's it. Oh.